Just a quick reminder that you can watch all new videos completely uninterrupted and free from all annoying ads like this one by becoming an MGuy member on Patreon. Link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. So let's just remind ourselves of the good old days. You built a coal or nuclear power station and you could have it running 24 seven to provide a constant reliable source of electricity for up to 60 years. It had a relatively small impact on the environment, taking up a single site and provided the baseload generation required to power a modern economy. Fast forward to today and we have thousands of windmills and solar panels, none of which are under our control, but which are dependent on the weather and scattered far and wide across vast areas of the country, all linked together with miles and miles of new access roads and transmission lines, trashing huge areas of pristine native forest. They also have a life expectancy of barely a third of our old fashioned power stations, requiring the whole lot to be replaced every 20 years or so. But that's not the end of it because it gets worse. The power generated by these windmills and solar panels is intermittent. And obviously solar provides literally nothing at night. Any excess energy generated during the day has to be stored elsewhere which requires colossal infrastructure like the snowy hydro pumped storage boondoggle or humongous lithium ion batteries with a capacity equivalent to tens of thousands of EVs in a single site. And yes, just like the windmills and solar panels, the lifespan of these batteries is probably a decade or so at best, after which the whole lot will need to be replaced at vast cost. One of these batteries in New South Wales with a price tag of $1 billion has already failed, having started only a couple of months ago, with one of its transformers suffering a, quote, catastrophic failure, unquote. But don't forget, renewable energy is the future, people, and it's cheaper than anything else. Yeah, right. Welcome back to MGuy, British engineer and lawyer turned Sydney YouTuber. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like and make sure you click that subscribe button down below so you don't miss out on any future videos and visit the MGuy store for some cool anti-EV merch. Link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. So I'm going to start with a clip from a video from the Center for Independent Studies uh, featuring Zoe Hilton, who is one of their energy experts, and it very clearly explains why there has been a honeymoon in renewable energy. I'll let the video do the explaining, but there comes a point when you add solar panels and windmills to a grid where you reach what's called local saturation, where the energy being fed into that grid exceeds the demand. And then you have three options to deal with it. You can either waste that energy or you can move it either through space by means of transmission lines or move it through time, which means basically storing it. And these are the things that increase costs substantially as the penetration of renewables uh, increases beyond a quite a small amount. Let's watch the video. So regardless of whether you waste, store and or move excess energy, once you reach local saturation, costs will only go up. And the more wind and solar you build beyond this point, the faster costs will increase because each additional unit of energy has to be moved further and further in space and time. This is where the idea of the renewable energy honeymoon comes in. Adding wind turbines and solar panels to the grid is easy at the start because you can build on the windiest and sunniest sites that are close to existing transmission lines. Thermal generators like coal and gas plants that provide stability for the grid can simply be turned down a bit to make room for renewables. But this honeymoon period doesn't last forever. Mathematically speaking, the local saturation point must occur at or before wind and solar reaches 60% of grid penetration. In the Australian context, when we factor in the weak anti-correlation of renewables and the current ratio of wind and solar in our grid, this number drops to 32%. But realistically, it's more like 20% due to the minimum level at which our existing coal and gas generators must keep running. All this means is that the honeymoon period for Australia ended at 20%. And we're now at over 30% wind and solar. So what this tells us is that while it may 
be easy to increase the penetration of wind and solar and storage systems early on in the process. As soon as the penetration gets above even 30%, suddenly everything becomes harder and more expensive. You've got all the good sites for solar, you've got all the high ridge lines for wind turbines, they're already developed with turbines. So every site that you look at now is going to be less ideal, which makes it more expensive, less efficient. So it's a law of diminishing returns as that penetration increases even further. So getting to something like 90% renewables uh, is an absolutely mammoth task and it will never happen. Let's have a look at the article now. Uh, this relates to the huge Waratah super battery. As the Sky News um, reports here, Waratah's $1 billion super battery failure throws coal to renewables transition into disarray, experts warn. The renewable transition has been thrown into disarray after the nation's most powerful $1 billion battery was hit by a catastrophic failure, experts have warned. The failure of the 1 billion Waratah super battery in New South Wales has thrown the energy transition timeline into disarray, according to leading energy experts. It comes after the AFR revealed the super battery, owned by BlackRock through its subsidiary Acacia Energy, suffered a catastrophic failure in one of three giant transformers. A second transformer has been taken offline for testing and may also need to be replaced. The battery is a key component of New South Wales' renewable transition and was expected to be fully operational by the end of the year. Sky News understands the super battery has been running at about 50% and full operations have been delayed by about a year. Centre for Independent Studies Energy Research Director Aidan Morrison told Sky News transformers like those at Waratah were typically long lead and took years to procure. It's unlikely that the Waratah super battery will operate as intended any time soon, he said. And this is our idiotic Prime Minister pictured there. Mr Morrison said that the super battery was one major element in a patchwork of investments intended to keep the electricity system stable as coal plants retire. It was one of the earlier projects that was procured as a priority infrastructure project under the Electricity Infrastructure Investment Act, he said. And that priority infrastructure uh, provision basically steamrollers over any of the objections of local residents or planning rules or anything. It just means that you can get these projects through much quicker than you would be able to uh, if they had proper scrutiny. The New South Wales government has been urgently amending the EIIA to allow even more ministerial directions to be advanced with even greater urgency, Mr Morrison said. The total scale of costs required to replace the security and stability of the coal system we have already is hard to keep track of, he said. The initial timeline envisaged for coal retirement is now in disarray. Transgrid's application for further funding for system security investments has been disputed and in any case revealed that there was no credible path to allow erroring to close in 2027 without seeing gaps in system security. And the article concludes, experts have cautioned that the failure illustrates the fragility of the country's renewable energy transition. It will be very interesting to see what emerges from the investigation, in particular, who supplied the transformer and how it was being used at the time it failed, Mr Morrison said. He noted that the New South Wales government was still finalising modelling for potential configurations of the battery, even after construction had commenced. Earlier this year, the New South Wales government refused to disclose market modelling completed in late 2024 for the Waratah battery for potential configurations of the battery, he said. So it appears that they were still trying to figure out exactly how the battery would operate long after it was committed, parts ordered and construction commenced. And here we go, surprise, surprise, Federal Energy Minister Chris Blackout-Bowen did not respond to Sky News requests for comment. Of course not, because why would he? It's unfortunately just an example of how disastrous the idea that you can move a fossil fuel powered electricity grid to wind and solar, unreliable uh, renewables, 
uh, just at the drop of a hat, which is basically what 10 years is. And batteries like this one are just required simply because renewable energy, solar and wind is just unreliable and you need to smooth out the peaks and troughs of generation. It's so much more complex and as a result, it's so much more fragile, far more likely to suffer outages than our previous generation of turbine based power stations. It's just the reality and this is just the first of what will inevitably be a long line of failures. All right, that's it for this one. Thanks very much for watching. Really hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye for now. one. Bye for now.